see you all this morning. A little bit of a chatty crowd. I love fellowship. We'll get you back to that in a minute. But for now, let me welcome you all here to Antioch. I see a couple of new faces, not new to me, but new to the church, so welcome. You've been here more than five minutes. Just relax. Just relax. You can let your shoulders relax. You're at home with family. We're here to worship the Lord. You're not going to have to sing a solo today. Second, no, I'm kidding. Never going to ask that of you unless the Lord calls you to do so. But we do welcome you here to Antioch this morning as we worship the Lord together. And we're glad you're a part of our Antioch family today. We are here to do one thing. I keep saying it. We're here to do one thing. It's not to be seen. It's not to get our religion on. It is not to say, I'm checking that off my list for the week. We are here to meet with God. We're here to worship Him. So let's start that process. If you'll grab your bulletin. And let's sing when we all get to heaven. Now, let's not get in a rush, but what a day that's going to be. Let's stand and sing, thinking about what you're singing today. again there there are several things up here enough that Dave commented that I had a huge mess up here on the pulpit so I'm gonna try to work my way through them but first I've got three cards and uh, the first one is from the family of Ted Wilkerson it says dear church family with a grateful heart I thank each of you for all you have all your prayers for both my husband Ted and myself during the past 19 months of his health battle Especially your prayers for his salvation. On October, August 15, 2016, those along with others were answered age 83. The very next day, hospice had to be called in. I knew without God's healing touch, his time was running out and I would be losing him. The one bright spot in those dark days were the fact the burden I had carried for years over his lost soul was lifted. What a blessing to know that the man that I had known for 47 years, that even death can only separate us for only a while. The fact alone gave me comfort every day I cared for him. Because of God's amazing grace, when he called Ted home, God allowed me to know a joy and peace in this time of separation that only God uh, himself could give. Your love and your support during this 19 months and after Ted's home going also made such a difference. With love and gratitude, your sister in Christ, love Elaine. Amen. Amen. It says, Dear church family, this is from the Nichols family. Thank you all for the phone calls and all who visited the hospital and at home and all the cards. Our church family is the best. I love each one of you. You have made my recovery so much better and easier. Please keep us in your prayers. I still have a long way to go, but God 
God and I have got this. And then this one is from Barbara Carmichael. It says, Dear Pastor Dave Chambers, and although you do not know me, you will forever have made an imprint and change in my life. I was in need of help, and with Jennifer recommended you, your church and the spiritual guidance of God took a chance on me. I was able to receive the help I needed. I'll be forever grateful. My faith is strong and deep, and I'll never waver in my belief that God would help me. And my prayers were answered uh, with the help of your church. Thank you again for everything. Blessed in all your endeavors, he will answer our call and help your heart is pure, and kind, and honest. All right, a few announcements. One thing that did not, well, one thing just to brag on our kids. Um, I don't know if any of y'all saw this newspaper article, uh, but Delane is pictured. And also, uh, Tyler participated in this program. It's a STEM program that was offered through the high school. And I think they got to go to Wake Forest. And Delane, I think Noah got to do it too. I don't know where Noah is. Did you do this too? Oh, you just wrote the article. Gotcha. Noah wrote the article, but Tyler and Delane participated in this program at the high school. So ask them if you'd like to hear more about that. A couple of announcements did not make the bulletin. The men that are going to Hickory... If you're interested in going um, to serve this weekend, y'all be leaving at 9 a.m. on Friday morning and coming back uh, Saturday evening, probably between 6.30 and 7. If you'd like more information about this, uh, you can talk with Ralph or John. Youth, we're having a garden day Saturday at 9 a.m., so please come out here. We're going to tear up the what's out there and plant new stuff for the fall. And now we'll start on the back of the bulletin, if you, if you don't mind turning over and checking those things out. First of all, there will be a free-for-all this Friday, uh, the 8th from 6 to 10. There will be a WAM meeting Monday the 11th at 7.30 in room 101. Our monthly covered dish dinner will not be this Wednesday, but next Wednesday. Relay for Life, take note, is September 15th, and I think that those that are preparing, the Relay for Life team, are preparing food for that, and if you are bringing something, please mark Relay for Life and leave it in the kitchen. Youth, the, the fall retreat sign-up is happening now. It's going to be October 13th through the 15th. The, the fee for that, or the cost of that trip, is $75. Note, in two weeks, we have Antioch's 164th homecoming. Please plan to attend. We have Reverend James Fortner um, on tap to deliver the message that day. And then also note the uh, Mission Possible 5K is on September 23rd. Youth, there has been a challenge issued that if any of y'all can beat me, there will possibly be some hair dye taking place. So youth, <laughs> sign up for that, and you better start running. You've got three weeks to get ready. Man, if you're going to do something, just do it. How about some hair shaving? If we could get 100% youth participation, maybe. maybe. Uh, Y'all do get involved with that 5K. It looks to be a wonderful time to support the Philippine mission. Please come out. You, I told the deacons this morning, you don't have to run the 5K, but come out and support it as a church family and root on those who are running the 5K, as well as support this as some of the uh, extra hands that they will need to man some of the things that are going on there that day. But I do need to ask this question. How many of you have seen on the news that something is going on in Texas? Okay, really, I'm asking a show of hands. How many of you know that something's going on in Texas? Okay, good things are going on in Texas because the church is rising up and doing what it's supposed to do and loving on people. But that's because a hurricane has come through and things have been very, very difficult. You cannot imagine what it would be like to be told that you may not have power or food or clean water for one month until you've been there. I'll, I'll never forget, a few years back, we had an ice storm that took power for three days, and you would have thought we were absolutely going to shrivel up and die. I mean, really, I, I, people were whining and crying and moaning, and some had legitimate reasons, but for the most part, no. It, it, we are so spoiled but we live in a country where we have all of those amenities. Houston, right here in the middle of the United States, does not right now. And they are in desperate need. Be careful. There are a million scams going on because, unfortunately, people take advantage of this. They monopolize and, and take advantage of people during these times. So be careful. Don't do anything by email. Just don't. If you get an email, please, just avoid that. But what we are going to tell you is there are some very good ways to help. Number one, Samaritan's Purse is on the ground doing some great things. We trust them fully. So you can check that out online if you'd like. But also we have a personal connection with our church family through the Minnick family. Russell and Carla Minnick are there at 17th Street Church. 
They have uh, relief efforts going on in Houston as we speak. And so I'm going to give you, if you have a pen, grab that. I'm going to give you an address that you can go to to give. And they have assured us, and we know them personally, that 100% of what you send will go to make a difference in what they're doing as far as relief efforts on the ground in Houston. And here it is very simply. It's the www. Dot 17th Street Church, and that is 17thstreetchurch.org slash give. Once again, that is www.17th Street, and that is the number, 17th, 17th Street Church dot org slash give. Please, if God lays it on your heart and gives you the ability to do so, give from the heart so that we can help make a difference. And here's what I ask people to do. I'm not begging you for anything. This is not for me, but I am begging you to listen to the Lord because these are people who are in desperate need, regardless of what happened or what their lifestyle was before. These are people who can be touched tangibly with the love of Christ by your giving in your heart. So please, please pray about that. Pray how God can use you and give as he leads. So it's www.17thstreetchurch.org slash give. Also, is there a Charles Hall in the house? You knew I had to do it, brother. Are you going to stand or did I just point you out? Stand up, Charles. Come on, one second. Charles Hall, happy birthday, brother. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you for a good beginning of a good day. Thank you that we come into your house today and we celebrate you and the love and the goodness that you have displayed to us. And beside what you've done, we just celebrate you because you are God. And we are grateful that we have the blessings that we do in life, but beyond all of those blessings, we're just grateful that we have the opportunity at eternal life through Jesus Christ, through the greatest act of love and sacrifice ever shown or ever to be shown. You loved us so much that you gave Jesus, your only begotten Son. And if we would but believe and live and love him, that we'd not ever have to die, but we could live eternally. What a beautiful gift. What a beautiful truth straight from John 3.16. So God, today we celebrate that. And I pray that if there is even one here that is yet to accept you as their Lord and Savior, that you would tug on their heart and that the words we say today your word as it speaks to him, the songs that are sung would touch their hearts and draw them into our family, the eternal family of God. But God, thank you for all of these announcements. Thank you for all of the cards. Thank you for everything that's going on in and around this little church. God, continue to bless it, but help us to remember you'll only do so as we follow you and are obedient and make you number one in all that we do and say. God, be pleased in our worship today and we just ask that you would just glorify all that we do and that we would glorify you in all that we do. I pray it in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. You know, I think there's some puppets here today. Anybody want to see the puppets? Yeah. All right, well, come on up top with me and Pastor Eric and see these puppets today, and then we'll dismiss you for Children's Church. And while they're coming, the pastor forgot September birthdays. Which is bad because my birthday's in September. So if you're born in September, stand along with Charles Hall and let's sing to these folks. out like I did that on purpose because that was much cuter with the kids choir up here singing, right? All right.
told you to turn it off is not the right thing to do. Frankly, it is just not good behavior on your part. God's word tells us to honor your father and mother. And Deuteronomy 6.18 says, Do what is right in the Lord's sight, so that it may go well with you. As you can imagine, after the choice you made to disobey, all is not going to be well for you. <laughs> I understand, Mom. And I'm sorry for being disrespectful and not obeying you when I should have. I couldn't have stopped it when you told me to and then worked my way, way back up to the next level the next time I played it. I loved my game, but it wasn't as important as being obedient and doing the right thing. Will you accept my apology? I definitely will, and thank you for that. Just remember to stop and think about what is right the right thing to do instead of being selfish. Oh, I will. I definitely will. And, Mom, you can count on me. <laughs> Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word and for your words that tell us the right thing to do. And we thank you for today and for the opportunity to hear God's word and have it shared through us. And we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and his love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, time to dismiss for Children's Church. Everyone ages 3 to 3rd grade, y'all head on out to my right and have fun this morning and behave. church workers let's continue with worship grab your uh, hymnals and turn to page 424 stand if you're able and join in the offertory hymn heavenly sunlight <coughs> Father God, we thank you for the beautiful day that you've given us. Lord, we ask you to be with Pastor David as he brings a message this morning. We ask you, Lord, that the offering that you receive this morning will go out, spread joy and love into the world, and bring more people to recognize that you are the true one and only Savior. So, Lord, as we partake and go this way, we ask you to bless each one of us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Journey now, gotta make it to heaven. 
and somehow those empty spin tries to turn me around. He shocked everything that's got a name, all the wealth I want, worldly fame, if could still wouldn't drink up for my journey now. I started up trapped with the Lord many years ago. Had a lot of heartaches, made a lot of grief and woe. When I would stumble, then I would humble down. There I'd say it wouldn't take enough for my journey now. Well, it wouldn't take enough for my journey now. Gotta make it to heaven somehow. The good has been tries to turn me around. He's off everything that's got a name, all the wealth I want. Well, if they lived, could still wouldn't take that for a journey now. There's nothing in the world that ever take place God's love. Silver and gold can never buy His love from above. When my soul needs healing and I begin to feel in His power, there I'd say it wouldn't take that for my journey now. Well, I wouldn't take that for my journey now. Gotta make it to heaven somehow. The devil has been trying to turn me around. He's off everything that's got a name, all the wealth I want. Well, if they lived, could still wouldn't take that for my journey now. Well, I wouldn't take that for my journey now. Gotta make it to heaven somehow. The devil has been trying to turn me around. Off everything that's got a name, all the wealth I want, world and fame, if the good still wouldn't take that for my journey now. If the good still wouldn't take that for my journey
What a beautiful song. If that doesn't make you smile, I'm not sure what will. Unless I say, hey, now turn on three and grin at your neighbor. Okay, you ready? One, two, three. Turn and grin at your neighbor. All right. Now you're about halfway awake. Grab your Bibles and do not turn to the passage found in your bulletin. If you are able to find that passage in your Bible, you need to get a new Bible. That is, in fact, a typographical error. It's probably my fault. Whosoever it is, turn to 1 Corinthians 13, 5, as you will not find a 1 Corinthians 13, 15, A. So 1 Corinthians 13, 5, as we continue in a series of messages about the summum bonum. The summum bonum is just Latin for the greatest thing or the greatest good. What is most important? And I started months ago with the premise that I believe, and I believe Scripture teaches us completely, that love is the greatest thing in the universe. It is the one thing that will completely outlive all other things that we know. It says that right there in 1 Corinthians 13. It says, Now abide these three, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of them all is love. And there's no doubt as we look at those three things that faith and hope are powerful Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, you cannot even know God. You can't wrap your arms around God physically, but you know He's there, don't you? You It's just like the wind. I love what Billy Graham has said for years. I can't see the wind, but I certainly feel the effects of the wind. I know it's real. It's the same way with God, and He is more real even than the wind. And it takes faith for us to believe that. And then once you believe that, seeing is really easy. Sometimes it's not believing is seeing. Sometimes, well, excuse me, sometimes it's not seeing is believing, but believing is seeing. So faith is critical. It's important. Hope. And without hope, we are utterly useless because if we feel like we've got no hope, we just give up. So these are powerful, powerful premises. But it says in that passage that love is even more powerful. Love is eternal. Love will always exist. And there are a million proof texts that would allow me to stand on that truth that I just spoke to you. But suffice it to say, this series is built on the premise that love is the greatest thing in the world. And guys, I don't mean that touchy-feely love that the world's throwing out there. I don't mean the kind of love, the word you use when you say, I love my Mountain Dew, or I love my pizza, or not even the kind of love that you use when you say, I love my family. This is agape love. This is the kind of love that is unconditional and endless. And this is the greatest thing in the world. Well, if it is the greatest thing in the world and it is a means to the greatest end in the world, which is to please God, we need to know what it really is. And I think having a good working definition is critical in that. So we've talked about the importance. And Paul begins by saying, listen, if I did everything right, even if I gave everything I had, right down to the point of sacrificing my physical body, if I don't do it with the motivation of love, I still miss the point. He said, if I could speak every language that there ever was known to man. You know there's more than 7,126 living languages today. And he's saying, even if I could speak every language, even if you or I could speak 7,100 and some languages, I mean, how do you even fathom that? But even if you could, if you're not using that language to communicate the truth of Almighty God in love, then you're just spending time making noise. And he goes through these proofs and he's saying, listen, everything I do should be with the motivation of love. And if that were to be our true motivation, loving God and loving others, which in fact is the great command from Jesus himself, he said it in Matthew 22. They said, what's the greatest command, Jesus? He said, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and strength. And the second one's like unto it is to love your neighbor as yourself. If we were to truly filter all our actions, all our words, everything that we thought and did through that premise of loving God correctly and loving others, this would be a radically different world. It really would. We would eradicate every issue that you could call and claim as an issue. But because we let pride sneak in, because we let our humanity sneak in and trump real godly Christian love, we are dealing with a plethora of sinful issues all across the nation and even in our churches at times. I'll tell you, I had the opportunity to speak in with several church leaders over the past few weeks, and it's just amazing to me what will happen in a church where we're supposed to know better. But do you know why it's happening? Because people began to think it's their church. Let me tell you, this is not my church. It's not yours. It's not the deacons. This is God's house. 
And we come here to love one another and learn how to love others and God more effectively, more scripturally. And I'm listening to these things and my mind is just blown. And then the second thought is this. Thank God for my family at Antioch. May I always be able to say that. Oh, yes, we too have our warts and do things that we shouldn't at times. We have little hiccups. But I got to tell you, you guys are doing a good job loving on each other. Keep it up. And when little things do come along, hear these words. Hear me saying it. More importantly, hear God saying it. They will know you by how you love one another. When things come up, and they will, you know why I know that? Because the devil's going to make darn sure of it. He's going to make sure that Martha better than you is upset with John Doe at some point in y'all's history together at this church. He's going to make sure that somebody ticks you off. Whether they meant to or not, the devil is at work trying to tear our church apart because he knows what Jesus said. He said, a house divided cannot stand. Whenever those things come up as they will, look in the mirror and say, wow, I'm still not perfect myself. I can't expect them to be either. They made a mistake. I'm going to love them anyway. Amen. It's going to happen. But the Bible says we will be known by how we love one another. But the problem is love is not easy. See, love is not just an emotion. Love is an action. Love is something you've got to do, and it's hard to work at that. But we must. Because if the world's going to know us as God's disciples, if we do it right, it's worth doing. And if they're going to look and say, well, they must not be God's disciples or church full of hypocrites if we don't, we've got to work at it, right? It's worth it. The end goal is to show the world that we are different, that we do know God by how we love Him and how we love others. But the problem is that requires what's known as behavioral therapy. Now, that's the name of the message today, and unfortunately, a lot of you know exactly what that is, because if you've ever called me up, Pastor Dave, we need to come talk to you. And I set up a counseling session with you, and you come in, guess what I use on you? Behavioral therapy. You may not have known it, didn't call it that, and you may be insulted now, but that's just what I did to you. My job is not to be a therapist or a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but as a certified Christian counselor, it is to use the Word of God to listen to what you're saying and see where what you're saying and have done, your actions don't line up with this. Because you know what? Psychologists and psychiatrists don't have anything better to go by. I can promise you. This is the Word of God. It's inerrant, infallible, and it is still that thing that tells you what's right, what's not right, how to get right, and how to stay right. If you've read 2 Timothy 3.16, you know that's a fact. It's good for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So when you come to me, I do one of two things. I either tickle your ears because you love the Word of God and you say, gosh, I didn't think of it that way, or I absolutely tick you off because I didn't give you some magic pill and fix you. But what I'm doing in every situation when you come is I am using behavioral therapy to try to change your thinking and behavior because if something is going wrong, many times it's a self-inflicted wound because of disobedience. Did you hear what the puppets had to say this morning? It's just as simple as this. If you're obedient, God's blessing you and carrying you along even if things are difficult. If you're disobedient, God is that loving Father who chastens whom He loves. And things are not going to be what you want them to be in many cases, and they're certainly not going to be what he intends for them to be until you get right. So what I'm trying to do in 99.9% .9 of the cases is trying to help you adjust your behavior to match God's Word. Behavioral therapy, according to the, the Manual of Psychology, is this. It is an umbrella term for types of therapy that can treat mental health disorders. And you're saying, wait a minute. You just said you used that on me. I don't have no mental health disorder. If you think your way is better than God, you are more mental than a schizophrenic. <laughs> you hear me? You are more mental than any other diagnosis that could ever be given you if you think that your plans and your ways are greater than God's. So yes, when I work with you, I'm trying to help you with a mental disorder. So it says, an umbrella term for types of therapy that treat mental health disorders. This form of therapy seeks to identify and help change potentially self-destructive or unhealthy behaviors. That's what I'm trying to do regularly. Not because I want to fix you, because I know that God wants to grow you. 
that God wants to see you become that mature Christian that is a tool in His hands that He can use to reach others. That's what I'm trying to do when you come to me. That's what I'm trying to do every Sunday morning up here in this pulpit is adjust behaviors and thought processes that are not potentially, as this says, but that are definitely self-destructive. Because again, if you're doing it against this, even in the small things, it is self-destructive. It is. And so we think on that. And then it goes on to say, this is based on the idea that all behaviors are learned and that unhealthy behaviors can be changed. Now, we might mince words there as far as whether or not all behaviors are learned. Let's face it. Sometimes you are just born with the ability to do something wrong. We are born with that sin nature. But whether learned or not, I do believe the last part of this definition from the Manual of Psychology that says all unhealthy behaviors can be changed. So I would submit to you that we need to make sure our thinking is not mentally wrong. That we understand this is God's Word. Either it is or it isn't. And you don't come to it like a buffet and pull and pick and choose. And you don't just use it to win an argument. And you don't win it to try to convince somebody just of one thing. It is a take it or leave it all in one manual from God Himself. And if we look at it and say this is God's Word, okay, then that's what's right. And we need to mentally accept that. And then we need to be willing to change our potentially and oftentimes destructive behavior. So when I tell you something, if it's coming out of this book and you get angry, please understand, you didn't hurt my feelings. You don't have to come back and apologize for popping off at me. Take it up with the author. He's saying, this is what you can do to change it. And I'm just mimicking and parroting back to you what that says. But I do believe that all unhealthy behavior can be changed. But the key to that is willingness. Are you willing? And so today as we look at something that God says in His Word about love in this love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, understand that this is speaking to you. And you need to listen, not just today, but every day and say, what is it about my behavior or my thinking is it that I need to change? I love some of the examples that you'll find in the Manual of Psychology about what behavioral therapy really is. For instance, a man comes in to counseling and he says, I just, I feel awful, and clearly he looks haggard, he looks unrested, he looks bad, and it just gets worse and worse. You're like, well, what's going on? Well, I'm not resting. Well, why are you not resting? Well, because I hate to admit it, I'm 50 years old, but I am terrified of the monster under my bed, and I have been since I was a kid. Behavioral therapy says this, cut the legs off your bed. (laughs) Think about it. Where's that monster going to hide? You just squished him, all good. Or, or... Then there's a guy that walks in with a carrot up his nose, a banana in his ear. You like that one? Yeah. (laughs) Carrot up the nose, banana in the ear, and and he's wearing a big old cluster of grapes on his head. Doctor, you know, I seem to be having trouble. I I don't know what's going on with me. And the doctor says, you're not eating right. (laughs) Joke grenade, you'll get it later. Behavioral therapy is that. It is that. It is as simple as recognizing something that's quite silly in most cases that needs to be adjusted. And yet we are so blinded by our own pride thinking that we've got it all figured out that we're too busy saying, I'm okay, it must be somebody else. You've been around that person, haven't you? Lots of people have this victim mentality that it's all about everybody else. It's not my fault. And yet we're not willing to look at the silliest of things, the easiest of fixes. All of behavioral therapy is due to inappropriate behavior. And that's what we need to figure out. And that's what we're going to talk about today is what's appropriate behavior in regards to love. Inappropriate behavior is what we are supposed to be taught against all through the years growing up. How many of you were taught that you go into the restroom and cook dinner? No, you were not. You don't go to the bathroom to cook dinner. You do other things in there. How many of you think it's a good idea to go have a hollering contest in the public library? No, that happens at Spivey's Corner if they ever reinstitute it. You don't do that in the library. It's just crazy. It's not what it's made for. How many of you were ever taught that you're supposed to play horseshoes in a china shop? (laughs) Silly things, but sometimes we just don't let it sink in what's appropriate. I got this question, and this is a side tangent. little extra message, no extra charge today. 
So if we don't play horseshoes in a china shop, we don't cook our dinner in the bathroom, we don't have a hollering contest in the library, why then do we come into God's house with our refreshments and kick our feet up with all our foods and our candies, and we found Cheetos in the loft, and your Mountain Dews in the house of God, and dressed like you're going to a hoochie party sometimes because you can't cover your body, why do you come into God's house and act like it's your living room or a dance hall or a movie theater? If you were here Wednesday night, you recognize that Robert and I had to step out of the choir. And I hope Robert's okay with me sharing this. But that's what it was about. If anybody thought Robert and I were fighting, you were wrong. Robert's my dog. He don't ever win a race. <laughs> it wasn't that. <laughs> Cindy's loving that I just called her husband a dog. I stepped out because of sheer frustration. Because I wonder when we're going to get it that this ain't just another entertainment venue. It is inappropriate to bring your drinks in here. It's inappropriate to come in here dressed like you're heading somewhere downtown for a party. And I'm not talking about people that are wearing clothes that are their best. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we got a dress code that says you got to dress to the nines, but you do need to be covered. Amen. It's God's house, y'all. Come on. And you would not believe what we find in these pews. You can make it an hour or an hour and a half when the preacher gets frisky without your drinks. Without your snacks. Yep. This is not your living room. This is not a movie theater. This is not a dance hall. Right. And I'm begging you all to understand that when you come in here with that garbage, it is inappropriate behavior. You say, I didn't know. Amen. You know now. Amen. Robert, thank you for talking me down off the wall, but I still had to mention it today. Robert got to hear the raw, uncut version of that the other night. Moving right along, that is inappropriate behavior, and that's why we have to have behavioral therapy. And I would submit to you that our behavior in regards to love, the way it's supposed to be displayed, is just as inappropriate. Because if it were appropriate, things would be different in our homes, in our lives, in our businesses, and everywhere we went. So the bottom line is we need to understand how to behave appropriately. What it says here in 1 Corinthians 13, 5, just the very first part of it, and y'all knew you were in trouble when I'm not even doing a whole verse, but listen. Charity or love does not behave itself unseemly. Well, that sounds great, but what does it mean? Love does not behave itself unseemly. It's as simple as this. If you break that down in the Greek, it just says this. Love behaves appropriately. But therein lies the problem, because if you go to Webster's and say, okay, what does it mean to behave appropriately? It means to behave according to cultural norms. And that's what we're doing. But that's dead wrong. That's out of context here. That's what Webster says. Cultural norms are what anymore? Whatever the heck you want to do. And I've told this story before, and it's sad, but it points out something that is real in our society today. How many of you remember I Love Lucy? Some of you know where I'm going with this. I've used this a lot. A lot of you remember I Love Lucy. Young people, go to YouTube and look at some I Love Lucy. It's great stuff. Do you realize that Lucille Ball was married to Desi Arnaz Jr. right there on the show? They were husband and wife as actor and actress, but they were married in real life. But do you know when they would go into their bedroom and start having their time to go to bed and, and talk about their day or whatever or anything was happening in the bedroom, they were in two different beds separated by a nightstand. Now listen, I, I am not proposing that that is what you need to do. I could not get any closer to my wife in the evenings because there ain't going to be no nightstand between us, okay? So I'm not saying that that is scripturally right. What I'm saying is that we had modesty back in those days, and they wouldn't show even a real married couple in a bed together. Now the way they got it, Fred and Ethel would be in there with them. I'm just saying, tell me it ain't true. Tell me it ain't true. It's the truth. Listen, we've gotten to a point where moral relativism has taken over, and do whatever you want to do, because if it's right for you and it feels good, just do it. Oh, that is straight from the pit of hell. That's inappropriate. So if we're going to go by Webster's, we're doing a good job. We are behaving when it comes to love appropriately if we're going by Webster's because we're supposed to be going by the cultural norm. And pretty much now love whoever, whatever, however, whenever you want to. That's what the world would tell you. But let me tell you this. Young people, you have been inundated with that garbage. It's not what the Word of God says. And if He is God and He is, then He gets to tell us what's going to work because who knows better? 
And His Word does not say that. So what I want you to understand is when it says love does not behave unseemly or love behaves appropriately, remember that in context, He's saying it behaves appropriately according to what? Not the world and the cultural norms, but according to God's Word. And that hasn't changed just because we got more technology. It hasn't changed because we've got more wisdom or knowledge in these noggins of ours. And it will never change. God is the same yesterday, today, and will be forever. You know why? Because perfection doesn't need to change. And if He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, guess what else is? His Word. It is the unchanging, immutable Word of God. And if we would love according to what this says, then we are loving in a way that is behaving appropriately. But I'll tell you what I deal with on a regular basis. It is the cultural norm for a husband to push his wife around if she's not doing what he wants. And that's wrong. And if there's a man in here that's laid a hand on his wife, shame on you, that is the most cowardly act you could ever commit. And if you've done it, get right with the Lord. It's not right. And the cultural norm will tell you that it's okay to yell and scream at each other. I have yet to do a wedding for animals, nor will I. I love animals. And some of you, you lose your animals, we put it on the prayer list because I know it's like family, you love them. But I just tell you, I haven't done any weddings for animals. I'm not going to. It's just ridiculous. There's churches around here that have blessings and such and ceremonies for animals. We're not going to do it. So that being said, why is it that so many of the people that I am a part of their marriage ceremony end up a few months later screaming and yelling at each other like they're dogs? I don't get it. That's a cultural norm that's wrong. The devil has fooled you, and if you're doing it, shame on you. It's time for you to grow up. Don't tell me you can't survive in a marriage without yelling. Missy, when is the last time I screamed and yelled at you? Oh, let's see. Never. Ask her. It doesn't make me less of a man. I don't bow down and do whatever she wants. We talk about it together and come to God's conclusion on our knees. Don't tell me you can't do it. And I'm not saying that to say, hey, look at David. If we had the opportunity, I'd argue. She's the one that don't let it happen. She's like, let's pray about it. Okay, let's pray about it. That's a good idea. What I'm saying is it's not right. And then there are those who would say, oh, it's okay if my wife is, is not providing for me everything I need for me to step outside the marriage and to be pleased so that I can stay married. It's a lie. You commit to it's one man, one woman for one lifetime. That's a marriage. It's a marriage. And if you've been guilty of being a part of any of this, I'm not trying to cut you off the knees. I'm just telling you that's what the culture has fed you that is dead wrong. And if, of course it's not going to work if we're doing that. But the Bible tells us how to love and behave appropriately. So let's look at just a little bit of that. We can't find all of that right there in 1 Corinthians 13, 5. It just says behave appropriately if you're truly going to love somebody. First of all, let's superimpose that over loving God. If we are going to love God as He said, He said it real simply, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Is that just the 10 that we find in Exodus? Not hardly. It's not the 10 that we hear repeated in Deuteronomy. It's all of them. Get into God's Word and understand that it is God's Word. And if you think your way is better, you're mental and you need to change your behavior and be obedient to God. You want to show Him you love Him? Do exactly what the Word says. Learn His commands and keep them. And I promise you, it's fun. There was a song out years ago that our youth loved. And one of the lyrics said, what was it? Serving God and walking with God is way more fun than sin. And it is. Because it's guilt-free, and it works. And He blesses you, and He takes care of you as you do that. So, first of all, to show real love to God, why don't we keep His commandments? And let's look at some of those in regards to other people now, because that's what we're trying to figure out, is how to love God and how to love others. How about 1 Peter 4, 8? Now, there's no way you're going to probably get to all of these, because we're going to be flipping a lot this morning. But 1 Peter 4, 8. If you're taking notes, I'll say it twice so you get it. But 1 Peter 4, 8 talks about how to behave in love, and it says that it, love forgives. It's interesting to me how we say we love each other, and we will hold a grudge like a cat. You know, we need to be cat, I mean, dog Christians instead of cat Christians. You ever thought about that? You ever think about a dog? A dog, if a dog does something wrong, and you just whop him right upside the head and say, you big dummy, you can yell at him, whatever, that dog will be right back in about 10 minutes. Ready to shake hands and ready to play, man. That, that, that's how we need to be. 
Somebody hurts us. But uh, cat, uh-uh. You make a cat mad, they don't ever forget you. I had a cat that lived 20 years. 20 years. And I think part of the reason that cat lived 20 years was to spite Barrett Rogers. <laughs> Barrett came to our house. The youth used to come to our house every Monday night and just destroy it. It's okay, it's just a house. We were glad to have them there. But they'd come every Monday night and they'd watch wrestling and they'd play chess, I know, all ends of the spectrum. But still, they'd come and play and hang out and we'd do a devotion. And anyway, Squirt, our cat, 20-year-old cat, when she was little, Barrett aggravated the mess out of her. Just made her so mad she'd run off and hide. And every time Barrett would come in the door, the cat didn't even have to see him. She'd like... She could not stand him because she would hold a grudge. She wouldn't forget. And that's the way we are, unfortunately. We got a bunch of squirts in the church. A bunch of squirts in the kingdom of God. Because we hold a grudge. So what? They offended you. They hurt your poor little feelings. Oh, I'm sorry. They're not perfect. Guess what? You're not either. Forgive them because you've screwed up too. Amen. And it says this in 1 Peter 4, 8, And above all things... Have fervent love among yourselves, for love covers a multitude of sins. It covers it. It wipes it away. And then there's Ephesians 4.32. Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. The next time somebody hurts your feeling and you decide to hold a grudge and not forgive, just remember this. You are not loving God, nor are you loving your neighbor, which is a direct command. Because he said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. And it says right here in Ephesians 4.32, even as Christ forgave, you forgive also. Forgiveness is not an option for us, guys. Get over it. They hurt your feelings. They didn't set out to hurt your feelings. Very rarely have I seen that happen. Oh, I see it all the time, and this was a banner week for hurt feelings. It was just one of them great weeks for hurt feelings. It's time for you to all get over it and move past it because they didn't set out to do it. It was just misunderstandings. Move on. Just move on. Not my words, his. That's how to behave appropriately in regards to love. You forgive. How about this one? Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. How many of you have a tally sheet? Huh? You got a tally sheet, a memo pad full of things that people have done to you? You're collecting those offenses? Not really. But some of you are grinning because you know you've got a little section of your brain, a little file cabinet section right behind the hypothalamus that you're keeping those records of wrongs. It's time to let it go. You know who that's hurting? It ain't hurting the people that hurt you. It's hurting you. Because you are flying in the face of true love in the way God said. Display it. It says this in the Bible very clearly. 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Look at that. The rest of the verse we're looking at today. It says, charity seeks not its own, it behaves itself and is not easily provoked and thinks no evil. Guys, let it go. Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. It lets it go. How about this one? James 1.26 and the whole chapter of James 5, love holds its tongue. Now, this is a tough one. This is a tough one. But I'm just going to tell you, if it takes this, I want you to literally do this. Now, I, I'm going to freak Liz Taylor out right now because I'd have shaken every hand in this place today, and she hates germs. But watch this. If you're getting ready to say something that is not uplifting, something that you would not want said in front of Jesus Christ himself, whether it's the truth or not, do this. Uh. Do it. Hold your tongue. Because you'd be better off to get sick from the germs you got from somebody and you just put on your tongue than to break someone's heart and maybe turn away a brother or sister or a potential brother or sister or to displease God. Because here's what James 1.26 says. If any among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. What he's saying is that you can talk about being religious all day long. But if you don't hold your tongue when it's necessary to hold your tongue, whether it's true or not, some things don't need to be said at that moment. Hold your tongue and say that only which is edifying or you're deceiving yourself thinking you're religious. And your religion is empty is what it says. And then there's James 5 that talks about what destruction, what a great fire, what a mighty problem it can kindle yes, amen. if we don't control that little thing in our face. And guess what that thing does, too? This is connected to these. Because whether you say it or type it, 
whether you text it or Facebook it. And I said, you know, I, I told Robert Wednesday night, I said, I'm going to quit talking about Facebook. I guess I fibbed, Robert. I'm sorry. Whatever form of media it is, if you are typing, it's the same as saying it. You need to learn to hold your tongue in your fingers. Amen. It ain't worth it, y'all. And you're hurting God every time you do that. Love holds its tongue. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, he deceives his own heart and his religion is empty. And oh, what a mighty trouble that tongue can kindle. Get a hold of that thing. Love edifies only. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 says this, Now as touching to things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge, but knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Oh, and, and then there's Ephesians 4, 29. That goes in tandem with that. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearer. Now, I started with this in the, when we started talking about love. But the bottom line is, if it doesn't build up, it's only doing one other thing. It's tearing down. There's no neutral in your words. You say, well, that's not really true. Maybe in very isolated instances, there are neutral statements. But I would submit to you that I believe that this is pretty, in fact, positive all the time Ephesians 4 29 either you're building up or you're tearing down your brain, your words speak life or death and so if it doesn't speak life if it doesn't build up if it doesn't encourage why is it that we in our pride have to get it out there anyway let's just hold our tongue and let's edify love builds up it doesn't tear down and you may not like some of the people that are in your forever family because you have different personalities different interests and sometimes you just don't like them, and you can't even figure out why. That's one thing. But you must display Christian love in their life because you are forever family. And if you've got a problem going on with a brother or sister, you've got to forgive it and move on, leave it on the altar, or everything else you do is hindered by that. That's not my words. The Bible says if you've got something going on with your brother, you go fix that before you even come leave your offering on the altar. Guys, we've got to get this right. They will know us or not know us as God's people by how we love one another. So love builds up only. What about this one? Love sacrifices. That's how love behaves appropriately. I love this. When you talk about love, it's like, well, I'd be willing to do anything for them. Oh, but I don't want to give up that. You know, I deserve a little bit too, don't I? I mean, this is my time. This is me time. This is money I save for me and I need to do this or I need to do that. When you get eye trouble... You are not loving. If it's all about what you want, that's not love. You see, we've been fooled. Inappropriate behavior tells us love is give and take. That's baloney. Love is give. Amen. Love is just give. Yep. And I always get this question, well, if I just give, 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 who's going to take care of me? What a dumb question. <laughs> if you give, give, give the way you're supposed to according to the Scripture and love with all your heart, God's going to take care of you. Amen. That's right. Promise you. You're not going to be left out in the cold. And if you're truly loving, you're not going to worry about who's going to take care of you. You're trusting God anyway. Love sacrifices. How do I know that? Ephesians 5 says this. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Oh, we love that part of the scripture that says, wives, submit unto your husbands. We like to skip over that part that's right there with it. Oh, man, right there with it. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And I would submit that if I get enough scripture together here, I could, I could convince you easily that we're all supposed to love each other the way Christ loved the church. And love is sacrifice. Because you see, Jesus came and gave everything. He stepped out of glory and put on this humiliating temporary flesh when he was already eternal. He was deity. He was God. He stepped out of eternity into time and allowed his own creation to spit on him and to beat him within an inch of his life and then nail him to a tree he created so that he could build that bridge the choir just sang about. That's love. It's sacrifice. And if we are Christians, we're supposed to be what? Like Christ. You're going to wear his name but not act like him because you're not willing to sacrifice anything because you won't, won't, won't? I'll tell you something. If it's stuff that's keeping you from loving, you need to learn to sacrifice because that stuff's just going to be left to someone else to fight over when you die if it doesn't fall all to pieces before them, which is most likely because they don't make anything to last anymore. But what is it that you're not willing to sacrifice for those around you? Love was willing to sacrifice it all. Look at what Jesus did. 
Love does not slander or gossip. James 4.11 Speak not evil of one another. Brethren, he that speaketh evil of his brother, and ladies, it doesn't leave you out either, it just means everyone. He that speaks evil of his brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law of love, it's implying here, and judges the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. Pretty harsh if you really look at the context of that. Basically what he's saying is, hold your tongue, do not slander, do not gossip, do not speak evil of a brother or a sister. It doesn't fit with the parameters of all the other scriptures I've already read to you to this point. But it also speaks to the fact that when we slander or gossip or share something that's none of our business to do, that we are sinning. And we are setting ourselves up in a position of God because he's saying then you're not just a doer of what you're supposed to be doing. You're setting yourself up to determine what's right and what's wrong. We're not qualified for that, guys. We're just not. Now, if God has already in black and white judged something, we have to stand with it, no matter how hard it is. But you cannot be and should not be the Holy Spirit in someone's life. Let God be God. Let God be the judge. And quit gossiping and slandering about people and hurting them with words or insinuations or shrouded prayer requests. Because that can turn into something slanderous and gossipy real quick. Finally, and it goes along with the sacrifice, love is not selfish. And this one I want you to turn with me to. Turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. This is the last passage we'll go through. And somebody's like, thank God. It's all right, bear with me. This is too good just to cut off. Philippians chapter 2 says this, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of hearts and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem the other better than themselves. Look not every man unto his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What he's saying about love here is that love genuinely is more concerned with the other than self. Coming up at the Risa Baptist Church on the 24th of this month, I'll start a revival and the series is going to be about joy. You know, every revival you go to, you go expecting to just get beat up and pounded by the pastor, right? He's bringing out the hellfire and brimstone because we're doing things so wrong we need to fix it. You know, the Lord gave me freedom to do this. I'm taking a whole different approach. It's how to have joy. So it's a radically different approach. I hope you'll join us, except for Wednesday night. Be right here in your own church. But on the 24th, I'm going to start talking about joy. And I'll never forget it, and I'm sure it wasn't something native to him, but when Michael was a little billy fellow, he, he read or heard somewhere what real joy was. And he, he's like trying to write it down and explain it to us, but basically it was J-O-Y, and it was Jesus, others, you. Now, in that order, Jesus first, others next, and then you. You know what Philippians 2 is saying? Let this mind be in you which was in Christ. Be unified under my banner of love and show love in this way by putting everybody else and everyone else in your life, God and everyone else in your life first, and then you bring up the rear and guess what? You'll have real joy. And it's so true. It's so difficult, but that's why we're having behavioral therapy today. Because I'm here to tell you that if you're not putting your spouse first, your children, the church members around you, especially the ones that you just can't stand, if you're not putting others first and God at the very top, it's not going to work the way it's supposed to. Your behavior is wrong and potentially, in fact, I would say it is destructive behavior and you need to adjust your behavior. You need to cut the legs off your bed and kill that monster. You need to pull the fruit out of your nose and learn to eat correctly by consuming the Word of God. And you need to do what it says. Not my words, His. Love is way more worried about using God's resources, His time, all that He's given you to take care of other people's needs. 
and to do exactly what He wants you to do. It is impossible, but possible. With God, all things are possible. We can't do it alone. But with God's help, you can do this, and you can make these behavioral changes. We need to use His resources. Remember that. Your money's not yours. Your time is not yours. Nothing you have is yours. It's God given to you on loan for a bit of time. You need to be using His resources and your abilities, attempting to better the lives of others by obeying the laws of biblical love. And I've just touched on a few. These are just a few of the things that love does when it's behaving appropriately. We need to determine to get rid of this inappropriate, selfish, <laughs> ugly behavior. Who was it, Mamma, that said, don't, don't do ugly, do good? We need to get to that point. It could be said of many Christians that we've got just enough religion to cause us to hate a lot of things, but not enough spirituality to love. Can that be said of you? Listen again. Do you have just enough religion to hate, but not quite enough spirituality to love? May it never be said of us, and I've already, I've already complimented you, Antioch, you know how to love on one another. You know how to love others. You prove that you love the Lord by your many gifts and sacrifices to people you'll never meet. Keep it up, but be on guard because I can tell you the devil is looking for a toehold. And it only takes just a small crack in the door of your heart to destroy all that we've worked for. Appropriate love. We can do better. Why don't we? Father God, Thank you for this day. Thank you that we can come into your house and share laughter and joy, handshakes and hugs. We can sing your praises. And we can enjoy all the things that we've enjoyed thus far. Thank you that we can also open your word this morning without fear of persecution and it can be proclaimed as the truth that it is. And we can get our toes stepped on and we can hear what we're doing wrong and hopefully make the adjustment. God, I pray that that's exactly what will happen. That we will have heard what you've said, not me, but that we would have heard what you've said and that we will adjust our inappropriate behavior. Because we haven't done a bad job here at Antioch, but we can always do better at loving people, loving each other, forgiving, holding our tongue, and being sacrificial. Direct us as to how to do this, because God, I've only skimmed the surface. Speak to us as your Holy Spirit indwells us and help us to do what you've asked, knowing that ultimately this is about loving you. And if we're going to say we love you, we need to keep your commandments. God, during this invitation, I don't know what you've spoken to these people, but I'll guarantee you you've said something, either through this message, through the songs, through the prayers, or maybe you've dealt with them somehow else this week, whatever the case may be. Help them to know this is not my invitation, it's yours. Your invitation for them to do business on the altar or right where they stand and leave here different. Father, may we all have experienced a little bit of behavioral therapy here today that we put into practice. And I pray it all in the precious and holy name of Christ. Amen. If you're able to stand this morning, page 448 is our invitation hymn. I hope that's your heart's cry, that you just have a closer walk. Stand as we sing. Respond as the Lord leads you. Beg him to help you love appropriately.
have a seat. Y'all see people up here, you know that's good news. And it ain't too late. I told you a few weeks ago, just plan on being here at 12.30 and then I'm never late. So I got five more minutes. I mean, it just seems to be the norm, right? Come on over here, guys. This is the, the Gentry family. They're no strangers to us. They've been here for, it seems like, forever, several yeah. years now. Uh, but, uh, and, and they want to borrow a million dollars, and Brad has agreed yeah. to that. Um, no. They've been here a while, and, and I have known this family. I can't even remember not knowing them. We went to school together. Uh, I'm going to tell on him. Wayne was just a little ahead of me. Candace was just a little behind me. But we've known each other for a long, long time. And here's what I've known about them for a long, long time. They love the Lord. Amen. And then they brought these two wonderful human beings into the world, Kendall and Griffin. And they are just a fantastic family of believers. They've been here for some time. Kendall's already a member. She got saved, got baptized, and joined and said, Mom and Dad, y'all can figure it out later, but I'm joining. <laughs> so Kendall's already ours, but she comes with her family, showing, showing that unity and that family unit together today, wanting to join our church by transfer of letter from Olive Branch. I'll take Brad as a first, Robert Wilson as a second. All in favor, a big loud amen. amen. All righty, welcome home. Is there anything you guys would like to share this morning? I would like to say one thing. Um, since, since the first time we ever came in, into this building, there's not one time we didn't feel the Holy Spirit's presence. Amen. Uh, you know, and, that's, and that's a testament to, to, to the members of this church. Um, and, and, and it just warms our heart. Um, what... Eric and his family and Drew and his family have done with the youth program has meant a lot to our children and we thank you for that. Um, I'm glad to be here. Amen. All right. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Griffin, anything? Kendall? Candace? I think Wayne said it all. Thank you all for welcoming us so much. All right. Y'all wonder why I get close to people when they're talking? It's because I got a mic and I want y'all to hear them. <laughs> it's, it's not some weird twitchy it's thing I do, hear. I promise. Um, so anyway, we welcome you. They're going to stay up here for a few minutes so you can come love on them and welcome them officially to the family. They've already plugged in in so many ways, but grab them. Grab them and help them acclimate in other ways. Say, look, I'm on this committee, or I do this, or I do that. Come join me. And then they'll either say, oh, heck no, or okay, I'll come try it out. But help them dig in. Come love on them and welcome them to our church family. And let me just say this. Before we exit, I realize that some of you are thinking, man, he was trying to preach at me because of fill in the blank. This message has been formulated for weeks, and it will work any week. So please, don't anyone leave offended, leave changed. Please, and I dare you, I triple dog dare you to, li yeah, I know, I just went straight to the top, triple dog dare. I dare you guys, go love appropriately, keep God's commands, love on people as hard as it is to do, because people are knuckleheads, but so are you. Go love on people out loud appropriately, and watch things change around you. If nothing else changes, your heart will begin to be more receptive to God as he lives in you, the Holy Spirit. And you will be walking closer with him if nothing else. And listen, as you love people appropriately, some of them are going to turn you away. Some of them are going to treat you badly. But that's okay. God said do it anyway. And he's going to look after you if you do it. So please go love. Go love like you've never loved, making other people's priorities yours. But more than that, making God your priority, okay? God bless you guys. Robert, close us in prayer this morning, brother, and y'all come love on this new family as a part of our fellowship. Father God, we just come today thankful for who you are and who you for us and the uh, grace and mercy you bestow on us each and every day. We thank you for this time that we can come and hear your word, Lord. I pray that we take it to our heart. God, we're all brothers and sisters. And just like family, we're going to fight. But God, I pray that we love each other with love like you have given us an example of the God we sacrifice for one another that we're all brothers and sisters. God, I thank you for the family. I thank you for the Jesuit family that you come and join today, God, just to add to your um, kingdom and uh, add to your family here at Antioch. Lord, just uh, let us all work together to spread your word in this community and in this world. We ask this in your name. Amen. All right, guys, we're still standing here because we want you to Sunday after Sunday join the choir of the full amen before you exit. It's part of our worship, okay? Thank you. Okay. <laughs>